Well, hello, hello. We had to um, try and find somewhere to put the chairs that weren't uneven on the grass so that we were going to tip round towards you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Kate Moss. I'm a novelist and a playwright, and as many of you know, the biographer of CFT. And it's my great honour to be the host of these pre- and post-performance talks. And it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Blanche McIntyre on her debut at CFT. So I think we need a round of applause before we even start. There. <laughs> so you didn't even have to say anything. I know that. But thank you very much. <laughs> I'll try and live up to that. I'll try and deserve it. So um, we're sitting, obviously, on the extraordinary set of Round and Round the Garden. Yes. <laughs> um, just before we get going with some particular conversation, could you just say a little bit about what this sequence of plays is and how they fit together, just so that we're all clear what we're talking about? Of course. Um, yes, they are, they're, they're three plays written as a trilogy, um, and they cover a weekend, a particularly uh, farcical and traumatic weekend in the lives of a family, two sisters and a brother, and their three partners um, at the house of their old mum, um, who we don't meet. She lives upstairs. We never meet her, but she's a, a very powerful presence in the house. Um, and each of the plays takes place in a different part of the house. So this one, as you can see, is in the garden. Uh, there's another one which is in the dining room and um, covers a couple of rather uh, stressful meals. <laughs> and, um, and one more which is in the living room and that is where most of the... Uh, well, where the youngest daughter lives, spends most of her time. So that's where the detritus of daily life mm. has collected and it deals a lot more with that. Now, I, I read... Um, Alan Akebourne obviously is a great popular person here and we were all very proud that uh, we managed to do Way Upstream here with The Real Water. It's a notoriously uh, difficult <laughs> show to do, isn't it? Um, so it's a great pleasure to have another play back here by Alan Akebourne. Now, I'm guessing here, you probably weren't actually born when he wrote those plays, or very nearly not I, born. I wasn't, I wasn't No, born. there we are, um, 1973. 1973, yes. <laughs> the plays, not Blanche, I have no idea how old Blanche is. Um, so there is a real sense of that period of time, yes. and they're played in that period of time. Yes. So for you, were these plays you knew anyway, or did Daniel Evans, the artistic director, come to you and say, I'd like a new fresh take on... Acheborn. You know, just tell us how it came to be that you're the one here doing this extraordinary trilogy. Of course. Well, it, it was, it absolutely was Daniel's idea. Um, and we had had a couple of discussions when I was at Sheffield about coming to do um, this show or that show. And, um, and I think he thought that these plays would particularly suit the space because there's a generosity about them and there's a, a, an epic quality about them, a sweep about them. And of course, they're also incredibly funny and beautifully well observed about um, uh, humans and the way that they actually work. Um, and so he said, I'm, I'm thinking of this, and I said, please let me throw myself at your door to, um, to propose myself for them, um, because they're so wonderful. Um, and he, 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 took me, he took me on trust. Um, it's been, it is very strange directing plays that are set in a period which is almost within, almost within reach, it, definitely within most people's living memories. Yeah, um, yes, you're amongst friends here, I think. We all, <laughs> we all remember the 70s, I think. Well, it's, and as, so, so do most people, but, since, but we've seen so many changes in terms of the way that people live their lives and the, way that they, uh, the values that they have since that time. That, um, that there have been, the cast and I have had a bit of a strange, sort of, a strange double vision trying to separate... The, uh, the bits which are so familiar that you might not notice the underlying ideas and the bits where you have to actually do some research as though it was a Shakespeare or a restoration piece because they have changed. And what's, what sort of things? Can you think off the top of your head? Of well, well, I think, for, for example, there's, um, there's a, a, a tremendous fight which goes on, in, not in this play, in, in Table Manners, between a woman who is a stay-at-home mum with two kids and a woman who is a working woman with no kids, and, the, and both of them feel as though they have to um, defend the choice that they've made about their lives with such vigour that they end up ripping into the other woman. And the idea you know, now, of course, most families, in most, in, in most families of working age, both parents work. So that's not the kind of argument that people would be having in the same way. But back then, of course, it was such a part of your identity that you could be completely threatened by somebody questioning it, I think. Uh, does that mean that you, therefore, have to 
absolutely set it in 1973, 74, rather than you, you, you can't be knowing from the outside? You absolutely do, I think. And there are, there are clues in the writing which work if you set it in 1973 or 4, um, which don't, I think, if you move it later. Um, for example, one of the characters is a vet, and he seems to be very... He seems to be terribly dim. Um, <laughs> he's, <laughs> a lot of the way that he behaves is, is impenetrable to the people outside. Um, and my lovely, the lovely cast member um, did some research and worked out that you could only be a vet, really. There were very few places that you could study um, to be a vet at that time. One of them was Cambridge. And so when he says, oh, yes, in the vacations, I, you know, um, I used to take my bike out of college, he's talking about a place like that. Oh, and so you have to rethink yeah, yeah. the way that you treat him. Yeah, yeah. And what is um, a joy about the trilogy is that sort of sense that we as the audience actually know more than the characters on stage. Yes. So when you're rehearsing, do you rehearse? This, this probably is a daft question. But do you do all of table manners? Then, you know, do you do them in sequence or do you mix them all up? Because they do blur into each other, even though they're written separately and self-contained. They do. And I was very, very tempted to rehearse them in chronological order because apparently that's the way that Alan Aitborn wrote them, a scene here, then a scene here, then a scene there, and, and so on. Um, I did... Uh, Last year, I was lucky enough to be able to direct Noises Off, which is, of course, another tremendous classic. Um, and then there is the, each of the acts has a slightly different, terribly, terribly badly wrong-going um, performance of this play that he wrote. And so I thought I'd direct that by starting with the Ur play. And, um, and I just... And what I discovered was that it confused everybody <laughs> so profoundly that they nearly didn't get back on their feet. And so when I was working here, half the company were going, yes, let's rehearse it chronologically, let's mix it up, let's do it like that. And the other half were going, please, please don't. Oh, God, don't. We can't cope. Um, and so in the end, I, th I remembered noises off and I thought, let's not take the risk. And in fact, it's a little bit like... Um, it's a little bit like... I um, raising a ship from the seabed or something like that. You sort of get a little bit of it to here and then a little bit of it and then a little bit... And then you go back to the first bit and polish it a bit more. And so you're trying to, rate, you're trying to lift the whole thing to a performance level. But because it's so large, you sort of have to do it incrementally um, and try and make sure that everything's about the same level. Because otherwise, you'd have table manners ready to go and round and round, hopelessly unready... And then the, the way that that would balance the stresses on the cast would be so extreme that I think they would, I, I, they would find it very difficult. Mm. And one of the things that I, I, I read, um, indeed in the programme, so oh, yes. one hopes it's true, um, about yeah. the original actor playing Norman yes. suddenly not being available. So Alan Aitborn having to write early scenes in the plays where Norman didn't appear because yes. the actor wasn't there to perform. Is that, is that right? I've he I have heard that as well. Right. I've heard that as well. And it is... I mean, I... It's a lucky accident, certainly. There's, it's, it's table manners, the, um, the play in question. And it's, it does a thing which is a, a time-old theatre trick where you hold the main character... Not the main character, but you hold the character that everyone's talking about away for as long as you can so that when they finally arrive, the impact they make is immense. And there is, um, even in the Oresteia, which is, of course, one of the, the oldest, oldest plays that is still remaining, uh, Clytemnestra comes on and doesn't speak and doesn't speak and doesn't speak. And so when she finally does, it has terrific impact. Um, and so even though it, I believe that it was... I, I think that story is true. It was that practical. It, it was than, practical rather yeah. than artistic. The, the artistic effect it has is, is rather wonderful. Everyone talks about him, and then he comes on, and you go, oh, now I see. Here you are, Norman. Here Welcome. you are. Now I know <laughs> what you're like. Right. But one of the things, obviously, I think most people here uh, will either have seen or will be hoping to see yes. uh, Leah over the yes, week. Yes, my goodness. So, of course, you have... You know, however the mm. company works, in the end, there's this enormous central role. Yes, yes. Now, in your trilogy of plays here, yes. it is properly ensemble yes. in that everybody matters. Yes. So what is the difference when you're casting an ensemble piece, particularly with the burden of three separate plays, however in yes. interlinked they are? That's a lot of work it, it <laughs> for anybody. Is. So what is the difference if you're not casting around a central character or a central pair? 
I think it's a difference of risk rather than quality. I mean, one of the, one of the joyful things about this play, these plays is that everybody has the same size role. So it's not just that it's ensemble, but it's an ensemble where each person is an equal pillar to the roof. Um, everyone carries the same amount, and if you don't see them for a while, when they come in, they have a few monumental scenes to make up for the fact that you haven't seen them for a while. Um, and so what that does, I think, is it means that no one can ever put themselves above the play. Everyone has to, ser- everyone has to be second. Their, idea- their self-esteem, even their egos, have got to be <laughs> second to what the play needs of them. And I, I, I haven't seen Lear, and I wouldn't want to speak because I'm fairly sure that um, Sirian is exactly that kind of actor anyway. And with many, pe- many plays which are based around a huge central role, you find that the, uh, the central role, the actor playing it, is terrifically generous and yes. not, a, not a crazy egomaniac who will make life difficult for everyone around them. But the risk is greater. Yeah. <laughs> and so there, there always is that chance that somebody will arrive with a sense of themselves that, um, that takes no account of what the play needs them to be. Mm-hmm. And the, it, it's much, much easier if you have a company which is... Uh, if you have a play which demands a true ensemble, that you also end up with a company that have a true ensemble spirit. And personally, I find that... Um, you have, you get very, you're likely to have um, wonderful shows that way because there's no room for vanity. Every, nobody can say, oh, I don't know if I look good like this because they're all of them working for what the play needs. And how do you um, run your audition room then? Are you somebody who has people in mm. mind and then you bring them in and go, if I put her with him and her with her, or do you actually just say, anybody who I think could do this come in and then you put them together like that? It's very much the second one. Uh, you, you never know. Um, there's, it's, all, it's, a, it's a very strange chemistry, um, sort of chemistry match when you're, when you're casting. Um, and again, thinking of... Uh, again, this is, these, are, these are not the Normans. Um, last, last year, I did one stra- very strange late Shakespeare and Noises Off, and I had two actors that I loved very much, both of them, wonderfully talented people, come in for both. And one of them could not do the noises off and ate the Shakespeare up. And the other one, it was exactly the opposite. He was totally at sea here and then wonderful in the comedy. Yeah. So you, you never know. But you hope that um, if, you, if there's somebody that you think will take enormous risks and really push themselves and at the same time be generous to um, the, 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 their fellow company members, you sort of want to see what they can do with a part if they're likely to be right for it. Just in case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with, um, with comedy, mm. particularly this sort of yes. farce, you yes. know, um, I mean, it is hilarious. I mean, that, that's the they, thing. You know, often you're just laughing properly out loud. Oh, I was laughing at the read-through. <laughs> it's, it's, the writing is just wonderful, yes. But is, there, um, is the issue of chemistry between actors mm. more acute or is it actually just the same as any play? It's... I, I think... You know what I, I mean? Because, I do know what you because mean. Because it's very it, intimate. Yes, it is terribly intimate, uh, but I, I think any, any piece of really good writing will have the kind of um, detail in, in the lines which will require an actor to, to really embed themselves. And the, the joy of these is that the, a lot of the jokes, a lot of the, the, the comedy comes from brilliant character of observation. I mean, there are some fantastically witty lines... But you need an actor who's also a wonderful character actor. So I don't know. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't audition people opposite each other. In some ways, I perhaps should have done, but I've been terribly lucky with the cast. So it worked out in the end. Because they look like pairs, that's why they I do, wondered. don't they? Yes, they, they do. really, really do. Um, yeah. But then I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if you have if you have two very matched parts, and then you have two people who can really do this part and that part, they're likely to have chemistry anyway. I, I, um, I'm so sorry. I wish I had a more interesting answer for you. <laughs> no, no. Your answer is interesting because it's your answer, Blanche. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Um, the, the other thing that um, several directors that, that mm. I've talked to and people here have, have heard say is that moment of moving from the rehearsal room yes. into the theatre. Yes. Now, you have done a glorious, glorious thing, which is finally... First time oh. in all of our history yes. here. We've got those seats, which I think have been pinched from up there, actually. But they have. God knows where the carpet came from. I'm, I'm very impressed with that. But 
it is an incredible thing to be in the round and to be looking out at our fellow audience members. Now, was that always something you wanted to do? I know they did it in the old Vic production as well, they I think, did. didn't they? So was that for you a part of it? Yes, well, it, it felt like, a, it felt like a, an idea that it was actually not my idea. I'm embarrassed to say it was the designer who said, um, this, is, this is the way that these plays need to be made. They were, I think, written originally for the round because he almost always does that. Um, but it also seemed to be when what you're doing is looking at six people who are slightly heightened versions of completely normal people yes. with whose, you know, whose difficulties come from their relations. We all know a reg, I think. <laughs> oh, goodness. I was at a wedding and somebody turned up and said, so I turned up on the A390 <laughs> and then I took the B and I was going, can I get my dictaphone out? So I can? Yeah. Um, but yes, I, th I, think every I think everybody does. And so I think there's, there is something very nice about, there is something lovely about being able to complete the circle when what you're doing is taking very, very normal heartbreaks and commonly found disasters and miseries and turning those into comedy. But when it's key that the, the people seem to be based in realism, not, not stereotypes at all, actually, actually human beings whose problems are as um, extreme as any, any human's problems, that they, any person's problems that they go th through in their life, it seems to be a particularly nice thing, a particularly lovely thing that, um, that you can look past them to the, your fellow audience members mm. and go, it's, I, this is making me examine my relationship with my sister. I wonder what it's doing to him. I wonder what it's doing to her. Mm. It reminds us that we're all sort of, we're, we're all pretty much experiencing the same kind of things that the Norman, the, the Norman Conquest cast do. And with the... But the, there are challenges, obviously, about yes. having people all around you. Yes. So does that mean in the rehearsal room, yes. you, you probably, mostly, but yes. also your creative team, do you sort of patrol round Absolutely. the whole time? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I know that it's the, it's the thing about being in the round that everyone will get a back sometimes, but they will almost always get a back for a short period of time and face for the rest of the amount of time. And so my, my thing is... The, or the, the thing that I had to do was to constantly be moving so that the actors didn't just settle down and play straight out. Because although there are many more people here, everyone has still got, everybody has got to have a good, um, a good experience or as good as I can make it. Um, it's, it does make it, it certainly makes it tricky in, um, in something like uh, table manners where people are sitting down at a table so you can't keep them on, a mo on the move. Here you can keep them spinning round and round the garden. But, um, but with that, we had to try and work out. So if these two are sitting here, then everyone can see apart from these two, so I'll bring somebody in here. Now these people can see. Now I'll move him around here. Now these people can see. And so you keep moving to, as much as you can so that everyone knows, if they, even if they get a little bit of a back, it won't be for long. But with... with I mean, one of the things that's so glorious about Akeborn is that... Yes. It, there's the verbal comedy yes. and the observation comedy, the comedy yes. of manners, but there's also the physical comedy. I mean, yes. a lot of the time, it's just funny the way somebody is standing. Oh, um, you know, because, So that's, a, you know, when you come in here, do you get, at the end of a rehearsal mm. period, the, the actors start to be desperate for an audience to be laughing? Does it start to become difficult not having laughter? There's... Um Akeborn actually wrote a wonderful book. It's got what I secretly think is a not very good title. It's called The Crafty Art of Playmaking. Um, and it's about, it takes him through how to write a play and then how to stage a play. And he uses his own plays as examples. And one of the things he talks about is how, diff how tricky it is to rehearse, that for the first week, you're still discovering it. So in the room, you laugh and laugh. And then you go back and start dealing with the underlying problems that are causing this extreme behaviour and then suddenly it becomes very dark. And after a couple of weeks, the actors start to panic and go, well, I wasn't get I'm not getting laughs now. I was getting laughs before, but not anymore. Um, do, I need to, you know, do I need to pull my trousers down? Do I, you know, was there, is there something else I should be doing here? And he said, One of, you know, your job as a director is to steer the cast through and go, don't worry, don't worry. Keep to... The, keep to the authentic feeling, keep to the, the, you know, the truth of what's happening, so that when you bring it to an audience, they'll ideally be laughing at behaviour they recognise, not at um, something which is absurd. Uh, so 
that's, that was what I was expecting. In fact, hilariously, the, um, some, of the, some of the cast didn't want to show it to an audience at all. Oh, really? And I think there is a quality about the plays that they can make a person feel quite vulnerable because you are putting yourself in these rather painful situations, these sort of breakups, heartbreaks, um, humiliations, these terrible arguments, they, you know, all their pressure points are pressed as characters. Um, and I think there is something... The, the first couple of previews were quite terrifying because suddenly you've been in this very small, rather safe rehearsal room and suddenly you've got, you know, it's got to be so large that it hits that back wall and you've still got to be taking the blows. At, but suddenly now they're blows that come at an enormous force because they're taking all the audience in. So I think there was a certain amount of apprehension. Oh, how interesting. But then, of course, the, um, the delight was that the audiences here have been so warm that that apprehension vanished very quickly. Do people laugh in places you're not expecting? I mean, you know, that, that thing about all of us in the yes. theatre. Actually, we do want to share with the people next to us, but yes. sometimes people laugh and you think, why are they laughing there? Absolutely. Or not so much in Akebourne, because you kind of know where it's going to land. No, well, there, there, there have been places where I simply didn't expect a laugh to happen at all. Often, again, it's because this particular audience is, um, is terribly fast. And so there is, there's, a, there's a moment in, again, it's table manners, where they can't find enough chairs to go around the table and the final one comes in and it's, it's too short. <laughs> and so the, um, he puts it down and we always have an enormous laugh. And I did not see that coming in rehearsal, but it's because everyone goes, I can see where this is going. Right. <laughs> they, <laughs> Very sophisticated audience, aren't it we? Is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, yeah. and super, super quick. It's brilliant. It's, um, I, we, I find that we're getting laughs sort of two or three lines before the punchline comes because <laughs> everyone is going, I can see this, I can see where this is going and they already get it. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. A couple more from me before we, we take course. some audience questions. Um, obviously, we all either love the piece we're working on mm. at the time or often as a novelist, you like the book you haven't yet written. Oh, yeah. The one you're writing, you're really not very keen on. Mm. You know, it's that sort of thing. But when you're doing a trilogy um, like this... Yes. Have you noticed with your actors, and I will ask yes. them in the post show and oh, see yes. if they tell the truth, um, do they have affection more for one play than another, or are there scenes that spring out? You know, that, it, that moment of this, this is about to happen and we really like this bit. Yes, I think there are certainly, there are certainly this is about to happen, we really like this bit moments, at least I hope that there are. Um, yes, we had, um, it, we had very shifting affections. Everyone had shifting affections through, the, through rehearsal. And I think it's because the plays are so different. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's, um, you, can, you can see here that there's, um, there's no, there are no boundaries, there are no walls. You can go wherever you like on this set. Um, and the play, correspondingly, invites a kind of freedom of approach. And the emotions in it are much looser. There's, some, there's a sort of... God pan quality that takes over the people when they're outside um, and some of the company loved that and some found it really exposing right. and equally with and again these are they're, they're sort of polar opposites table manners which because everything is all about you know does your napkin go here and do we use the soup tureen or do we use the saucepan and yeah. it's very it's it's much tighter and it's technically much more farcical so once you are confident with that it becomes incredibly fun to play but while you're still working out which fork goes where it's absolutely murder to rehearse right. and so I think that was a very very much the unfavorite until it became uh, practiced and then of course it changed. That's so interesting and in, we, we talked about it right at the mm. beginning about it being set very specifically you know yes. when Alan Aikbourne yes. wrote them in, in the 70s and I think for many of us that is the era of the good life and all yes. of those and of course Penelope Keith and Felicity Hendel were a part of the first casts of these you know very yes. early on yes. weren't they um, with um, the you know the attitudes you you've touched on it about mm. women who work and women yes. who stay at home but there is actually quite a lot of sort of 70s assumptions yes. about relationships and yes. the sexual politics between people yes. um were those things that you talked about as a bigger issue um from you know where the play was set and what was going on in the world yes. or actually did you just really work with the text and how to make it work within the confines of the comedy well, I think you always, you always need to start with the text. So, um, so we, we started there, but of course, 
very much as you say, once you, once you go in, you pick up much bigger issues that go over all three plays and you know, relations between men and women, ideas of how men behave and women behave are a, a huge, huge part of um, uh, what the plays are about. So we had to spend some time unpicking that. What is a, what is a good set of manners? What's bad manners? What do people get away with? Um, and there's also... I, and we, we spent a little bit of time on it, the, um, there's a, a shift of expectations between the generations, and it's not the one that you expect, because uh, mother upstairs, um, the, their, their old much, much trouble mother, it turns out was the most terrific goer, and, um, <laughs> and had all these relationships, cheated on her husband constantly, and was, you know, there are, there are drain pipes that are coming across because some, some man... Um, in the war had come back and he'd had to make a hurried escape when father came back unexpectedly on leave. And so there's a sort of terrific kind of freedom and um, uh, a sort of sexual licence about what mother got up to, which has obviously cast the most tremendous shadow over what these uh, poor people are getting up to in the apparently much more liberated 70s. And so we had to talk about generations in a very, very different way, that um, it isn't always what, you know, what, 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 you, what the sort of cloud nine um, kind of plays suggest that it yes, is. Yes, exactly. And finally, from me, um, we can see this is a beautiful set, wonderful mm. Simon Higlett, you know, yes, knows yes. Chichester so well, exactly knows what can do. And as an interviewer, I'm very grateful because when we had canvas and indeed Neville's Island, it was real grass. And by yes. the end of the interview, I was completely bitten to buggery, frankly. Oh, no. um, so this is lovely. Yes. Not, there's no bugs on this grass. But with the, um, yes. the relationship between designer and director is yes. so, so important because mm. they are helping to realise your vision. Yes. Did you um, have a strong idea of how you wanted to do it, or is all of that part yes. of the text and stage directions too? It's it's a little bit of both. I and mean, Simon was very very keen that it not be sort of um, what you might call comedy seventies. Yes. You know, with your with with uh, with your platforms and your you know your 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 Farrah Fawcett hair or whatever it is that it, it that it it reflects a little bit more. Um, life as it was then, as opposed to life as we now pop culturally imagine it. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a very, very good idea. And there's a, there's a line in Living Together, which I wish I could take a paintbrush and go over this house in red and orange and bright blue. It's like a brown museum, like a very dirty brown museum. And the, the things I was saying about your Mother um, and the shadow that she casts, they feel very trapped, I think, these characters, in a... Um, they're, they're, they're stuck because a whole lot of decisions have been made for them by the, the preceding generation. And so they, they're not trapped in the past, but they're very much trapped by past events. And so when Simon and I were talking about it, he said, I, I think that this should be a bit dirty, run down, grotesque. You use this line and follow where that, where that suggests. Um, and um, that the, um, as he pointed out, and I think it's true, um, we almost never live in a place where all the furniture and all our clothes are contemporary with the year that we're in. It's, no, it's no, no. you know, I don't, I don't know anyone who has a, a house which has been entirely furnished since 2015. Um, and so I imagine, so, so we talked about Victorian furniture, we talked about very much more old-fashioned looks, older books, ornaments, things like that, that... Um, the, the detritus that mother would have left before she vanished upstairs being a kind of reminder that they can't really get out from under her shadow however much they would like to. And hence the joy of the garden. The joy of the garden, is that, which is still terribly overgrown, as you can see. It's still absolutely gone to seed, but at least it's, you know, it's, it's open, it's free. What is so joyous? You probably can't see from there, but all over here, there are little daisies... I mean, it really looks like that sort of lawn, doesn't it? Yes. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, so, would anybody like to ask a question? Thank you, gentleman there. Thank you. You, Thank you, you. spoke uh, of very articulately of the importance of the generosity of an actor. And I wondered how easy it is to gauge that in an audition, where they're primarily by themselves, I imagine, or, or whether you have to have observed them in, in performance to be able to judge whether they, this particular actor is generous or not. Thank you. 
That's a, that's a brilliant question. It's actually strangely difficult to tell in performance. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who tells a story about working with a very distinguished actor who had a terrific trick of drawing him to him and gazing into his eyes in a way that said, I am listening to everything you say. If you looked into his eyes, they'd be dead. Because <laughs> absolutely nothing was affecting him, nothing at all. He'd worked it out around his kitchen table. Um, in fact, I think auditions are, auditions are a wonderful way to gauge that, if you get it right. Um, the, uh, my, my drama school gave me a wonderful piece of advice, which is when you're auditioning an actor, you have to get the best possible um, work out of them. And the way to do that is by putting them at much as ease, at ease as you can. Because that is the way, if you, if, you re if you relax the actor, they will show themselves to you, both their capacity and their character. And so if you bully them in an audition, you'll never find out what they're capable of. Um, they said you, if, you, if an actor goes out not feeling like they've done the best they could possibly do, it's your fault and you need to rectify it. And I thought this is fantastic advice. Um, and in fact, it does work practically very well. If you ask somebody to come in, they have a bit of a read. You talk to them a little bit about their ideas. You ask what the part it means to them. You ask them to do it with this change and that change. You can absolutely see how readily they take on a new idea, a new change, how open they are to, to conversation. Um, just as a human being with another human being. Um, and so whenever I've made a mistake casting, I've almost always wanted to kick myself because I've gone, I knew it, I knew it in the audition. Mm. I knew it and I talked myself out of it. Mm. But you, you almost always can see. How interesting. Thank you. Greg. Hi, I thought that um, the, the scene where two characters were talking about the roads they travelled on was very interesting, when, particularly when they were oblivious to everything else going on in the background in round, round the garden. So that's a way of asking you, Blanche, if you would tell us a bit about the journey you've been on, not the A roads you've been on, but <laughs> the, the journey you've been on to, to come from presumably sometime in the 1970s or 1980s to here to be a director. Oh, that's a beautifully phrased question. Yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to um, work some A-roads into it as well. A259 um, is very popular around well, here. Well, yeah. there you go, exactly. Um, yes, I, uh, I, was a, um, I went to sea when I was 15. I was a, a, a bookish kid with no friends. Um, and my parents took me to see Henry VI Part Three when I was 15, and I fell in love with it. It, um, it was in a very small, in the other place at Stratford, which you probably know. Um, and so being a bookish kid with no friends, I thought, um, first of all, I'll become a historian and an expert on the Wars of the Roses. This will be marvellous. <laughs> um, and this did nothing for me. Um, I couldn't understand it. And so I thought, well, I know what I'll do. That, that seemed to work so well. I'll find a, a medieval play of my own and stage it. And I was 15. Um, and I got together some friends and I chose Every Man, that medieval mystery play about how, you know, you can't take it with you when you go. So this was a fantastic um, choice for a 15-year-old. Um, and I got some friends together and said, we're going to do this play. And they said, well, who's the director? And I said, well, I don't know what, it, what does a director do. I've never heard of it. Maybe we could all direct it. And they said, no, there's got to be one and this was your idea. Um, and so as I worked out that, um, A, I was a disastrously bad actor and, B, directing was terrific fun, I just continued from there. So I went through university and then worked for Peanuts through my 20s. Um, working on the fringe with, again, collective companies where all of us were starving to death um, and living on a packet of crisps a day, but by God, we were going to make some art. Um, and, um, and then I had my first paid job, aged 32, um, <laughs> which was delightful and a, a terrific relief at Salisbury, so just down the road. Um, and luckily, I, I, um, I was lucky enough to direct a couple of really wonderful um, script um, one, a, a, a beautiful revival of an Emlyn Williams play from 1949 um, about uh, public hypocrisy and private morals, which is just, just wonderful. Um, and then a, a piece of new writing called Foxfinder, which is a sort of... Um, oh, uh, did you do that? Oh, it was terrific. Yeah. So it's sort of, if you imagine The Crucible, but with foxes instead of witches. Um, so absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And both of those caught people's eye, and so they started to take a chance on me. And that one thing led to another, and now here I am in probably what is the, uh, the grandest theatre I've ever worked in. Hooray! <laughs> uh, did you, um, but did you do, you know, just take, taking on from Greg's um, initial question. Yes. Did you then do any training at drama school or any sort of bursary, any, you know, at any moment? How were you taught to be the director who was doing Every Man with your friends to this is 
the responsibilities of a director. These are the things that you would have to do. Who, who gave you that training? I, um, I did. I trained at uh, Drama Studio London for a year, which I think they've now cancelled their course, but they, they taught me the, the very basics, as how to run an audition, for example. Um, and then I was lucky enough to win a bursary when I was 29, which was um, you, at the National Studio, which... Uh, allows theatre makers to develop projects so I was casting and the idea was that you work out who's out there because otherwise you just cast your pals most of the time um, so that, that was very lucky and they, half of the money from that went to a small fringe show so that was great as well um, but no I, it's, um, I've been I've had to throw myself on the mercy of various people who know what they're doing along the way because just as you say it's, um, it's all very well to go I think this is what it needs to be but you have no idea necessarily of the, um, the, the accepted codes of behaviour in the theatre as you wouldn't in any job. And so, and, you know, the, the night before the first proper tech that I'd ever done, I had to call up my friend and go, how do these work? Please tell me who's in charge. Who does the lights? Do I do the lights? Does the lighting designer do the lights? How does it, you know, what, what, what am I allowed to say and do? Um, and so, it, and, you know, I, I still feel a lot of the time I'm not quite sure what's acceptable in a room, but then I think probably that's, that's true of most people in theatre and possibly most jobs. When you start, you know, it's trial and error, isn't it? It is, it Just absolutely got, You've is. got a lot of people to trial and error with, possibly. That's the hope. You know, <laughs> yes, exactly. All of my people are imaginary friends, you see, as a novelist. Oh, um, that's wonderful. Um, very good. Um, another question for Blanche. Is there another question for Blanche? Gentleman there, thank you very much. Uh, one, wonderful plays and direction, having seen all three of them. But I was fascinated by what you described as auditioning, and particularly about the height of the various characters. Was it something that you deliberately chose for those characters, or did it just happen that they were like that? Because it really fascinated me. Oh, well, and, and first of all, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, no, in fact, it, it was pure luck. It was, it was pure luck. There was, um, there's always, you always have an eye to, a little bit of an eye to it. And I did once, um, I nearly got myself in a terrific hole um, where the love interest was, um, he was five foot four, I think, and I was about to cast a woman who was five foot eleven, and thought, "It's I, I, we shouldn't have a problem with this. We, sh in this day and age, nobody should have a problem with this. But somehow, I think we all do. Um, so that was that was that was very unfortunate. But um, but no, I, I uh, it was one of those wonderful things that had lucked out. I've heard that the last production of the Norman Conquests, the Norman in question, was terribly short." which, in fact, made it a rather wonderful thing that he was sort of constantly bouncing up to these much taller women trying his luck, um, that it, it, it put a completely different spin on it. And, of course, um, our, our wonderful Norman is, is terribly tall and, and dashing and broad, and so, you know, it, it, it makes sense in some ways that the, the various women would find him so attractive. But, um, but it, it is... It's, no, I, again, I, I wish I had a more interesting answer for you. It's just pure luck. <laughs> And yes, and your Norman, you know, succeeds yes. in looking sexy in a grey woolen hat. I, I know. mean, that's quite impressive, I think. It's, it's terrifically impressive. I don't know how he does it. No, no. <laughs> well, I've been looking around the audience, just in case. Um, is there a, a last question for Blanche? Um, uh, Blanche, you've you already uh, touched upon the question of the actors having their backs to people. In, in fact, isn't it rather easier here? Because in the preceding march, they've got to make sure they project forwards. Here, in a traditional play, they've got to remember those three sides but he, but um, now of course it doesn't matter much does it because <laughs> wherever they're facing they've always got the audience in front of them is, I, that, is, it, is it easier for them in fact i couldn't agree more i think it is much easier i think it's a, i think it's absolutely infinitely easier there's um, there is a there is a question of scale which is um which i think they had to get their heads around As somebody was saying it's like um it's like uh, a chamber theater it's like the other place and then epidaurus um, and so you, you have to work out how large you're being as an actor because something which will be large enough here might be much too large there. Um, so there is a, sort of, there's a constant sort of ellipse going on of, um, of scale. Um, but no, I, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely right. It's one of the reasons that I love this theatre. There's a sort of inherent democracy about it. There aren't tears. Everybody is sitting on the same kind of slope, pretty much, even these guys. And there is, it's, um, it's a wonderfully... Uh, 
oh goodness, this is not very articulate, but it's a space that embraces the company. Mm. And so the, you're absolutely right, the chairs at the back are a sort of extension of that. Now it's an embrace that goes all the way around, but it all, it's always felt, and I, I say this also as an audience member, like a, like a theatre which, um, which takes, its, takes its company into its arms in a way that's absolutely wonderful to be part of. Lady in the front row, thank you. Well, I think my question might follow on from that. And am I thinking differently? Or, oh, no. um, thinking of in the round, isn't it distracting just seeing an audience rather than just looking at the actors? Oh, I see what you mean. There is, it's been, it's, because I, I do a lot of sitting there just to check that they're not turning their backs on us all, all the time. The, the company refer to it as the lucky hundred. Um, <laughs> That the um, that it's um, there's it's there's a funny moment where you sit there when the lights are up and you sit out and go my God look at this space and all these people this is this is extraordinary um, all these faces facing me but as soon as the lights go down you are in the same position as the actors that the audience is almost entirely blocked out you see them as a sort of dark mass but you don't see anyone's expression so if you are sitting there the these people in front of you almost entirely disappear. It, it's wonderful sitting there. If you can get up there, go. Um, Blanche, I just, it's, you're very generous to be here um, before your Huge press pleasure. day. No. You've got all of them tomorrow. It's yes. one of the triple days. It is. Um, and the press are coming in. They are. Um, so very, very briefly before we finish, yes. what are you doing next? Because I know you will be off. You'll have your press day and then the directors yes. always sail off into the sunset, leaving their company behind. So what, what's yes. your next project? It's, it's a very... I always find it terribly sad. It's, That's um, it. It must be awful. It's, you, get, you, spend your, yeah. you spend your life with a group of people and you become very, very close to them. And then press night comes and everyone has a glass of wine and it's terrific. And at, at 10 o'clock the next day, they go, right, give your keys back and have you yeah. back um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm coming back because of course I, I want to come in and check that everyone's okay and what they're doing um, the next things I'm doing is um, is taking lovely Titus Andronicus what a what a contrast this has been from that um, taking Titus taking Titus Andronicus to the Barbican right. where it will have to go from a play that's set on this kind of stage to one that's on that kind of stage yes. so it will need a complete rework um, and then I'm doing The Marriage of Figaro, oh, which will be absolutely wonderful. I can't wait. Well, how wonderful. Well, we wish you all the best with all of these things. And we Thank wish you. you so much, so much goodness for tomorrow, um, you know, the day and for, for your wonderful company. Now, um, the thing I would like to say is a massive thank you, particularly to Neil, who always does the microphones, and all of the front of house people and people in Louise's department who come and support these. But also an enormous thank you to you because it is thanks to your generosity coming and supporting these things because you love your theatre so much that these talks have grown and grown and become part of what the creative people come for Chichester for. So thank you to you, but mostly, ladies yeah, and gentlemen, yeah. Blanche McIntyre. Yeah.